like you all to meet, she's going to speak to us today on the chakras. Um, we have seven chakras, and she will give us a rundown of each of them. Will she? Okay. okay. <laughs> um, the Theosophical Society was started way back in 1875. Started in New York, and it was founded on three basic principles. The principles were to set up an international brotherhood of humanity, no matter what country, caste, class, sex, or religion the other person belongs, to investigate comparative religion, and to investigate those powers latent in man. And those are our basic three principles. So I'll pass over now to Nice Thank you very Thank you. much. I'm grateful. And I'm going to pass it over to my American traveling companions who will sing for you. Far better than I ever could. <laughs> Part of our community, which is called Ananda. The founder of our community, there's a gentleman sure. who's photographed back here. He was a great musician and he wrote many original songs that both in the melody and in the words give a lot of the message of what the other things we'll be talking about today. So this is my friend Dambara Hi. and Hamila. They both live in, well, Dambara lives now in Oregon, but he lived in California with us for a very long time. And so we're, we're all part of the Ananda communities and our host, Kavita, who you all know, she's local. Okay, so, Okay. <laughs> 
That's song number one. These are all by Swami Kriyananda, right there. Great song, Sermons and Song, he called it. And this one is a song called What is Love? And mixed with many men. I've shared their days of sunshine, gone with them in the rain. The fires at evening said we were brothers. The fires at evening said we were brothers. A soldier I saw weeping beside a dying friend. My officers had said I must hate him till the end. But seeing his grief I knew we were brothers. But seeing his grief I knew Words we 
years were different, but joy one understands. Our gladness in God's world made us brothers. Our gladness in God's world made us And customs vary like waves upon the sea. One life beneath the surface binds everyone to me. Who knows the truth knows all men as brothers. Who knows the truth knows all men as brothers. And brothers, why endeavor to set ourselves apart? The fences we've been building squeeze tight upon our hearts. Come sing the truth that all men are brothers. Come sing the truth that all men are brothers. Thank you. months ago when we were in New Zealand for the first time. It's nice to see your lovely faces again. You are new and it's nice to be with you. Um, it's a uh, When I came to New Zealand in October, it was the first time I'd been to this country and well, I'm going to talk about, among other things, reincarnation. So I think I've lived here before. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow this country feels very at home to me and I like it very much here. I was just happy to come back. It took about a minute to feel like I was back where I belonged. So it's, I'm, I'm quite fond of California also, but I've never felt terrifically American, so it doesn't really matter. Um, our subject today is the subject of the chakras, which is a very metaphysical subject. It goes into a lot of uh, areas of life experience that some of which I know directly, but some of which I'm going to be sharing with you what my teachers have told me. And that's why I have these two pictures here, because I really want you to know that when I'm beyond myself, I'm at least in good hands, okay? This man is Paramhansa Yogananda. Many of you may know him. He wrote the book, Autobiography of a Yoga, Yogi, Yogananda. We actually forgot to bring copies of the book, but our friends are gonna bring some over in case any of you would like to buy a copy. Yogananda's Autobiography of a Yogi is one of the seminal books for any um, moving out of mainstream thinking. And if you haven't already read that book, I highly encourage you to do so. We'll have some copies, as I said, in a short time. Yogananda was born in Calcutta, India, Bengali. In 19, he was born in 1893. I can hold this picture up because I see some of you are straining a little. And uh, he... Uh, he was born in 1893, and in 1920 he came to America, and he spent the rest of his life until 1952, um, living in Los Angeles, primarily California, and really helped launch. I mean, the Theosophical Society was way early in this way of thinking, but he was one who helped launch uh, what we see now, which is this widespread interest in yoga, meditation, metaphysics, you know, you all were way ahead of it, but now there's a whole lot of people running behind you. And he helped start that parade. <laughs> this man is Swami Kriyananda. He was an American. His American name was Donald Walters. He died almost exactly two years ago at the age of 86. And he was, as a very young man, when he was 22, he met Yogananda and became his disciple. So this is a lineage. I met Kriyananda when I was 22, which was 1969. And so for more than 40 years, I've had the opportunity to study, live closely with him, learn from him. And so everything that I'm telling you is what these great souls have taught me and that I myself have practiced and integrated into my life so that I feel quite persuaded that this is really uh, a way of uh, understanding reality that has profound and important merit and is worth dealing with. What we're dealing with today is metaphysics. We're not dealing with religion. 
per se. I, I need to stay over here because we're making a video of this, and if I move over there, apparently I become a headless wonder. I just get disappeared into the light. <laughs> so if you all need to shift your chairs a little, that's okay. Everything, when, whenever I speak anywhere around the world, we film and it goes up onto the YouTube channel. So I, that's an important, uh, it's important for me to do that because then the energy just keeps moving. When uh, our friends return, they'll have a little slip that has about that also. So um, what I was saying is, so, uh, so oh yes, we're talking, about, we're talking metaphysics and not religion. And the difference is simply this. Religion is what people do and the way they explain sort of their perception of reality and then how we relate to it. All religions, all true religions, basically go back to the same peak of the mountain and they just come down that mountain or go up that mountain from different sides, but they're all going to the same peak of the mountain. Metaphysics has that word physics in it, which is to say this is objective science. This is not uh, somebody's idea of what would be good or interpretation of what would be good uh, or poetic explanation. It's just the way we're made, essentially. So just as we have many scientific facts that we're all agreed upon, Primarily, if you talk about the, the medical reality or the physiology of the body, we have widespread consensus on many factors of how the body is made and how it works. You know, we speak through the mouth, we breathe through the lungs, um, the heart beats, it pumps the blood. Nobody just comes along and asserts something completely other than that because it can be verified, objectively verified, observed, and confirmed again and again. So when we start talking about certain metaphysical realities in relation to, way, to the way the human body is made, and what we're now talking about is the way energy and consciousness expresses in the body. This is a little bit harder to verify for the simple reason that we can't just do it through the senses, like we can if we open a cadaver and see what the body is made. We have to, have, we have to conscientiously develop well, in the same way that a medical person would have to develop a certain knowledge, we have to develop in ourselves a certain capacity to perceive realities more subtle than we just see with the material body, with the material senses in the material body. But merely because it's subtle does not mean it's vague. And that's where a lot of times people get confused because it's subtle, they imagine they can make up anything. And this is why I, I stand in front of teachers whose veracity and, and right to speak, I, I, I feel at least, and is widely recognized at least as these are real authorities. Okay? So what is the purpose of the chakras and what are we talking about? The, the, the principle of manifestation in this universe, if you think about it, is that everything that's manifested in the physical world basically has three aspects to it. Everything has to start with an idea. And then energy is applied to that idea, and that idea, sort of a, a, a blueprint, in a sense, or an, a, a concept is formed, and then more energy is applied, and that form is manifested. This building has probably been standing here for a very long time, relatively speaking. But at some point, somebody had the idea that they wanted to build a building here. The building didn't exist, but someone had an idea that they would build a building. Then that idea, they applied more energy to it. They probably made an architect's plan and a drawing. Of, of course, a piece of paper is still not the building, but a piece of paper with the picture and all the details is more than the idea. And the more energetically we lay this out, then we take that blueprint, we finally manifest the physical reality. Now, all the ancient traditions speak of the fact that there are in fact three levels of reality that are exactly corresponding to those three. And those three levels are the causal level of reality, which is the, the level of ideas. There's the astral level, which is the level of energy. And then there is the physical world, which is of course material, the material world. And in this world, we use all three of them, 
But each of these planes of existence also exists just purely the energy and the causal world. The, the causal world leaks down to the, uh, to the astral world. The astral world leaks down into the physical world. And so we have the benefit of all three. But you can have the astral and the causal world without the physical at all. You can have the causal world without either the astral or the, or the material because each the, the subtle ones can exist without the grosser ones. Gross in the sense of, well, sometimes gross in the sense of gross, but also gross in the sense of not subtle. But the, the gross worlds require the subtle in order to exist. Now, when we start talking about the chakras, the chakras do not exist on the physical plane. They greatly influence the physical plane. And in fact, the entire physical plane, in terms of a human body and a human being, is defined from the astral and the causal level. But the, the chakras exist on the astral level, and then they manifest physically, and we have a physical, a physical counterpart. Okay, why don't we wait till you go. Take your seats, that's all right. Come in and sit down. Okay. I think you might need to scoot your seats over a little bit. I think this gentleman is, doesn't have quite enough room in there. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> okay, so the, the chakras are an, a not a physical phenomenon. They affect the physical world. In fact, they define the physical body that we live in. But the chakras are actually an astral and a causal reality. Now, if we think in terms of idea, blueprint, manifestation, what our chakras are are actually the blueprint of not only our physical body, but of our destiny. And the words that become really relevant, there's, there's three words that always have to go together, and they really work beautifully together. One of the words is chakra, the other is the word karma, and the third word is reincarnation. And you really can't talk about any of these without talking about all three of them. Because people talk about, let's start with the word karma, which has become a very nowadays common word. I've been, you know, in this field of study for many decades, and when we first started, these words were much more obscure. The word karma really came into its own, in my opinion, when I was in the supermarket, and there was a little uh, torrid romance book. I don't know if they published them here, Harlequin Romance Series. You know, they're, they're actually, they're good, clean fun, because the right people always get together, and the wrong people are always punished, but not too badly, you know, so it's, they're pleasant, they're pleasant books to read in that sense. So I'm in there and there's this picture on the front. This is, this is me watching the, the evolution of consciousness on the, uh, on the planet. And it's in the, in the picture and there's this woman and she's, you know, just isn't a torrid embrace with this man and she's rather a buxom looking woman and a handsome fellow and they're embracing like this. But over here you see the shadowy figure of another man. She's sort of looking over his shoulder like this. And then the little description says, was it Penelope's karma to be with Philip? <laughs> or was her karma with Harold? And I looked at that and I thought, oh wow, the new age hits the supermarket. So unfortunately, the more common these words become, often the less they're actually understood. Okay, Karma is a very simple word and what it means is cause and effect, which is for every, it's, it's the, it's the physics, physics law, for every action there's going to be a reaction to it. And what that says is that we, even though as individuals we move through this planet thinking that we're all on our own here, in fact we are utterly interwoven with the whole planet, with the whole of creation, in fact, that there is no point at which our experience becomes completely separate. A woman teacher was talking once about, uh, she was a, a metaphysical teacher, and she was trying to understand the concept of karma. And she talked about her little grandson. She was holding her little grandson. Well, actually, she had had, she was giving the lecture, and she had a bad cold, and she was having a little trouble. And the reason she had a cold is because she was holding her grandson, and her grandson sneezed in her face. And as a consequence, she got what he had, got sick, and there she was. So she started thinking about, now she's standing up giving this lecture with a congested voice because her grandson sneezed in her face. And so she started thinking about, why was I holding my grandson? Well, because he's my son's child and I was so happy, you know, to take care of him. 
Well, how did she ever happen to have a son? Well, before she could have a son, she had to have a husband. So when did she meet her husband? Well, she met him in this particular city where she was going to college. Why was she going to college there? Because of these things that had happened to her parents. Well, what had happened to her parents? Well, they had emigrated from some Eastern European country, and they were Jewish in their background, and they had emigrated because the Jews were being persecuted. Well, why were the Jews being persecuted? Because there was Jesus, and he was crucified, and he was crucified, and the Jews were blamed. So back over here. So where did it stop? She has a cold because Jesus was crucified. <laughs> and in effect, it actually was a straight line from one to the other. So we live in this world in which we are not independent. Everything is moving in this interrelated reality. Now, of course, it's very hard for us to see that, isn't it? I mean, you could run that little story, but what happens if you're driving down the, the road and somebody who's had too much to drink takes that moment to make a left turn and runs into the side of your car? I mean, you can still trace the same thing, but it gets very confusing. Why is it that some of us are healthy and some of us are not healthy? Why is it that some of us can make money effortlessly and others have to struggle? Why are some people tall and beautiful and other people not? You know, just all these different things that happen. It's very difficult to see and people try to make a relationship from what happens the moment you're born till the moment you die and try to make sense out of the whole thing. But you really have to stretch the facts most of the time to make that work. Even people who come out of the same family in the same circumstances. I've never been pregnant, but women who have had born more than one child tell me from the moment of conception the personality is there. And as soon as the baby is born, the, they just are who they are and they remain that way for the whole entire experience. So we have to get into some kind of a cycle to really make karma work. You have to start thinking about more than one lifetime. Or let me phrase it differently. Karma is hard to make sense of unless you add into it the fact that, w that when the baby comes into the world, it's coming in with a full history and not just a blank slate that we just start with. You may or may not accept that, but this system really doesn't work unless you're willing to accept that. When I first heard of the idea of reincarnation, I had absolutely no context for it. I was raised Jewish in America. And in, you know, I was born in 1947, and these were not things that people were talking about then. But as soon as I heard the idea, well, of course, because I believe in reincarnation, <laughs> I believe I was learning it again from lifetimes in which it was, I was in a culture in which it was accepted, which is the majority of the world, actually. Um, but it, it seemed like a really good idea to me. And I started experimenting with it. I just started trying to explain otherwise inexplicable circumstances in terms of this being a, a continuation of a story that started earlier, which is basically what you're talking about. One Buddhist teacher, when he was asked about reincarnation, said the problem that we make when we think about it is we think of every life as a specific event. This life ends, boom, over, we start another, he said, in fact, it's one continuous cycle of experience. And that cycle of experience is just exactly like changing your clothes. You just, today you're wearing this, tomorrow you're wearing that. And you can also even put on a really big disguise. You can put on a wig, you can put on a false beard, you can put uh, lifts into your shoes, you can add shoulder pads. But way down underneath all of that seemingly changed experience, you will still always be yourself. And if you take that image just as a way to imagine it and think, today I'm born in America, t next year I'm born in, next time I'm in Australia, then I'm born somewhere in Africa, and I wear all those different bodies and all that comes with it. But underneath all of that, there's a continuing thread that is me. So then you have to also ask the question, why? What is this all about? Why are we even doing this? Is it some kind of weird entertainment or is there any kind of a goal here? Well, if we think about progress in any way, even in terms of just a few years or a little bit of a lifetime, we, we can see that there are certain themes 
that we're always acting out and always living through. And those themes have to do with where does my happiness come from? You know, how can I bring into my life more of happiness, less of suffering, more of understanding, less of confusion? After I had been living in our spiritual community of Ananda in California, where I'm from, for a number of years practicing these teachings, I was with Swami Kriyananda in a circumstance once, and he was uh, sort of saying encouraging things to people, and I sort of wanted him. This, this incident happened to me twice. I got two different answers at different times. And I wanted him to say something encouraging to me, and I sort of you know, put myself in a position where he had to say something. And he looked at me and he said, well, Asha, you're a lot less confused than you used to be. <laughs> Which, at first, I thought I was being damned with faint praise. But then when I thought about it, I actually realized I was a lot less confused than I had been before. And that was a huge, just a huge uh, positive statement in, for, for my reality, because I had been quite confused. What was the purpose of life? And how do I live it? I mean, many times people just live without ever asking that question. The purpose of life is just what it is. But others of us really feel like we need to know. And you can draw very big pictures, and I by now have accepted very big pictures. The purpose of our life is, as Jesus said, to become perfect as our Father in Heaven is perfect. The purpose of our life is to become self-realized. The purpose of our lives is to become a Buddha, to become a perfect expression of divine love and compassion. You can make very big lists. But what it all comes down to is that we understand where suffering comes from, where happiness comes from, and how to find it. Really, it gets very simple. The thing about spiritual life is the closer you get to the center, the simpler it gets. That doesn't mean it's easy. It just means it's simpler. Okay. What keeps us from finding happiness, becoming a Buddha, being completely free, becoming self-realized. Well, it's the karma that we have. And so here's another definition of karma. Karma is unlearned lessons. Karma is ignorance. Ignorance not of, you know, algebra or geology, but ignorance of our essential nature and ignorance of where our happiness comes from and where our suffering comes from. In the Bible, they use the word sin, which has unfortunate connotations now. But the word sin simply means ignorance. It means an, a lack of understanding about the nature of life, which is why Jesus says, all of you were born with sin, but I was born without sin. He didn't mean the way it's been taken now, that all of you are evil in one way or another, and I'm not evil. He meant all of you have unlearned lessons, and I did not come because I had unlearned lessons, Jesus speaking. I came only to serve. All right. So the, the project of life is to resolve, work out, overcome all of the karma that we have. And the karma is to overcome what we don't know, to learn it. And every life experience that you're given is a lesson. I mean, this is by now, this is like a cliche. What is the lesson in this? But the lesson is it, it intended to move us to a higher and higher vibration <coughs> in terms of a real true understanding of where our happiness comes from and how to overcome suffering. And we may think that we're being tortured or mistreated or all sorts of things, but in fact, um, let me just think how to say this exactly. Everything is always in perfect balance. And this is where the chakras come in. So now we have the ideas. And this is, of course, this is the short version. <laughs> and uh, we'll, we can pass out to you later the little thing about how you can go on the YouTube channel and you can hear many more hours on these subjects. But this is the short version. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to here. The big question is, you know, I'll say, let me now, I'm going to talk specifically about what the chakras are the way I understand them, the way I've been taught. You may have other understandings because there's many points of view. I, I may be able to reconcile different points of view. I may just have to agree to disagree. But I, what I'm teaching you is what Yogananda has. And this is classical Indian yoga. Um, 
the chakras are, the, I'm going to make a, just a, a fabulous artistic piece here of a human being, okay? <laughs> that is the maximum art that I can do. And my person is always happy, okay? The chakras are, um, as we said, seven in number. I'm going to deal primarily with five of them. If you think about the human body, we, we realize even instinctively and physiologically, we emanate from the center. And we emanate in a, from a straight line that goes from the top of the head to the base of the spine. Not the spine, not the outside bony part, but as if there was a plumb line just dropped down to the bottom of the spine. It's interesting to think that a human being can exist from the bottom of the spine to the top of the head without legs and without arms. You can be just almost literally like a worm and either be um, you know, disfigured because of uh, accident or difficulty, or you can be born like that and you can still survive. But if you're smaller than that, then it's not possible to live. And there are physiological reasons why that's true, but the actual reason is that the astral pattern for the physical body is the chakras. And the physical body is manifested around the chakras. And it's not that the chakra is cut off, but when you no longer have the full extension of all the chakras, human life is not possible. This is the essential part of the astral form. Okay, the chakras, um, the first chakra is essentially where the anus is, at the base of the spine. The second chakra is where the, the sexual organs are, so this is one, two. The third chakra is where the navel is. The fourth chakra is where the heart is. The fifth chakra is where the throat is, here, like this. And the sixth chakra is the spiritual eye. And the seventh chakra is what they call the thousand-petaled lotus. Those are the thousand petals of the lotus. It looks a little bit like his hair, but it's not. That's fine. the thousand petal lotus, okay? Now, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something about the sixth chakra when I get up there in just a moment. This is number six right here. These are also corresponding to the gradual release from matter and elevation into spirit or the gradual descent of spirit into matter. Earth, water, fire, air, Ether. Ether is a, a word that means more subtle than air. It's not the gas that they give you to, to put you out. It's a different kind of ether. And then this is sometimes called super ether. This is just using English to try to say something that can't be said in English. Okay. Um, and if you talk about, and then this is the pure spirit up here. If you think of spirit descending, the, the spirit starts out completely free. It begins to take some identifiable form as ether. Air is not visible to the eye, but it's still made up of many different qualities. It comes down into fire, then water and earth. Let's go backwards. Earth is the solid form. Okay? Whenever something is on the, at the earth level, like this, they're just completely separate from each other, aren't they? Just, you can bang them together, I can throw it on the floor. And it always holds its form. It's very, very rigid. And that's what it is to come down into the material world. We come all the way down to this physical body. Here it is. And mine is separate from yours. And it's just, it has this form that's fixed. When you get into the level of water, water is still very clearly identifiable. See it? There's water right there. But if I pour this water, which I won't, onto this beautiful hardwood floor, if it was a rug, I would pour a little of it. But I would pour it onto the rug. We would still see that it was water, but now it looks like the rug, doesn't it? Whereas my little pen here always looks like a pen. But water still has an identifiable form, but it has more flexibility, doesn't it? Okay. Or they talk about the water element is like molten. You know, things have not quite taken a form, but they can move. Now, if you take fire and apply it even to solid objects like this, you could take fire and apply it to this whole building, which we're not going to do, okay? But if we did apply it to this whole building, the entire form of this building would be changed by fire, wouldn't it? It would be released. In other words, the form would be broken by the application of the, f the energy of fire. So now we're freer. We have more power at fire. Then the fire itself rises up as heat, 
and then we get to the element of air. And then that becomes even thinner if we go up into the highest atmosphere and it becomes the element of ether. And then ether transmutes completely into spirit and we've left the material plane altogether. So when the child, when the soul is conceived, when the, when the physical body is conceived, this is how Yogananda speaks of it, the sperm and ovum come together like this. Now, this is the sixth chakra and the opposite pole of it is the medulla right here. This is the only part in the body that cannot be operated on. They can operate on the brain, they can operate on the heart, they can even change your heart and give you somebody else's, but you can't operate at all here because this is actually, according to Yogananda, the actual seat of life. And when the sperm and ovum come together, they come together right here. And then the first thing that happens is the spine is created. When you look at the little picture book of your developing embryo, <laughs> there's a point when it looks like a little potato stick because it has descended all the way to the earth element. And now all the qualities are in place that will allow it to manifest as a physical body. Okay? So, um, now let me think what I was going to say with that. Oh yes, when the sperm and ovum come together, this is how Yogananda says it, there's a flash of light, and that flash of light is perceived in the astral world. Because when the animating spirit, which is our soul, another word for that is jiva, when our jiva, which is our individual spirit, is between incarnations, it still exists as an individual and it still has its chakras, but it doesn't have a physical body anymore and it's living in the astral world. It just has an energy body. The chakras exist only as energy. There's a flash of light in the astral world, Yogananda says, it says, and all those jivas who are in tune with the vibration of that light and are ready to reincarnate rush to try to get into the womb. That's exactly how he put it. I have no idea what that really means. <laughs> and he said, and sometimes two will co sort of crowd in. And it means that there's a, a vibratory connection between the place that you're going to be born and what? And your own vibration. A friend of mine, when I told this in a class once, she came up to me afterwards. She said, her son was now grown. She said when her son was five, she didn't know anything about metaphysics at that age. But she did something and he got real mad at her like little children do. Mommy, I hate you, she said, he said. And then he stomped off. And then he thought more of it and he decided there was more he could say. And he went to her and he said, you weren't even my first choice. <laughs> <laughs> and she was extremely interested. And she says, well, honey, who was your first choice? And then he said, a lady in the Philippines but she was taken. <laughs> and when he heard, she heard me say this about the flash of light and rushing to get in, she said her son has this particular characteristic, which is he gets really excited about something, but just before he plunges in, he, he stops and thinks about it for a moment. She could just see him in the astral world, heading for the lady in the Philippines, stopping to think, <laughs> and then somebody else got in, and so he ended up with her. <laughs> well, who knows? Out of the mouths of babes, these things come. Where could such an idea come? Except being a memory. Okay, so what we're dealing with now, I mean, now I've just sort of given you this picture. This is, there are many different ways you can describe the chakras. They have many different characteristics. This is almost introductory. I'm going to give you a different one now. Each of these uh, chakras, every chakra has a positive expression and a negative expression. The positive expression is when you use the quality of the chakra to, to work in harmony with your spiritual self, which is centered here. I talked about these two points. You know, this being the ego and this being the, what, what's called the spiritual eye, the center of spiritual understanding. The jiva, which is another word for soul, but jiva is a more accurate word. The jiva is the continuing reality from one incarnation to the next. Just when I was saying if we put on a costume, the continuing reality is this personality. The jiva is more subtle behind it. 
And in every incarnation from the very beginning to when God realization is attained, we have this unique individuality. That's the one of the great mysteries of this universe is this e eternally lasting individuality. So what happens to the jiva is the jiva, let me just wait, I lost the thought there. Oh yes, the jiva, um, the jiva is, is, the jiva never ceases to be spirit, completely spiritual in character, but it identifies with the body that it's in. It identifies with the physical manifestation. It identifies with the pure energy form of it. It even identifies with the causal idea of it. And in order to become completely free, the jiva has to break its identification with the physical, the astral, and the causal, and then freedom is attained. Which is to say merely to kill the physical body, or to have the physical body die, does not free the jiva. Because it's still identified with this. Now that's exactly, that's how it works, that we can be both divine and human, both perfect and imperfect simultaneously. It's not that we have actually become imperfect, but we've become identified with the life that we're living right now. And this is what happens right now. There's so many of these near-death experiences, or what is more accurate, death and return experiences, where somebody just steps out of their body and all of a sudden realizes that the rules of the game are really different than they thought they were. But we have been so identified with this experience that we forgot this whole other reality was going on. A beautiful story I read about a man who was dying of cancer and had been very frightened. And then from night to morning he became very relaxed because he'd had this experience in which he'd suddenly seen, well, he'd seen the ongoing reality of the jiva and the temporary reality of the physical body. And he saw that, he says, he put it, there was an edge to this reality that was always there, but he just hadn't noticed it. And then in, in the night, he just saw the edge of it, and he realized that you just move literally, as Jesus said, from this room into that room. And he said he couldn't see the edge anymore, but he could sort of feel it just right behind him. And so now all of a sudden, death was nothing except the jiva taking off this costume, walking to the next reality. Now, our karma is everything that keeps us from remembering that all the time. And because we get so deeply identified with these experiences, it's very hard for us to keep that straight. Now, every time we have any response, reaction, um, to anything that happens in our lives, we are always affirming whatever it is we believe to be true. And those beliefs are formed. It's not what we, even, what we think we believe is true, it's what we actually believe is true. I can talk a really good story about freedom from the physical body, the presence of God, everything happens by the will of God, but still, if I'm going down the highway and I think somebody's going to drive into my lane, there's always that just that moment of anxiety when that begins to happen. You know, just like, and what am I afraid of? Oh, I'm afraid my body might be hurt. I'm afraid my incarnation can be interrupted. We had an earthquake in California where I was living. It was many years ago, but mm, wow, when the earth begins to shake, it's quite an experience because on a really, really deep level, you do not expect the earth to shake. And I was inside a building and the building really began to shake. And so my you know, my instant thought was the problem was the building was shaking. So I stepped outside of the building and then found that the earth was undulating. And it was just, you know, you just, it, all this happens in a split second. You try to find a spot where it's not happening. But of course there is no spot where it's not happening. And I have to confess that my first thought wasn't just, you know, bring it on God, whatever you want. My first thought was more on the level of, <laughs> I calmed down, but not as fast as I would have liked to, because we just respond. And we respond somewhere from this belief, let's call it Earth, I am a physical body, I am separate from the entire creation, I am what I am, and that's all there is. And I have to protect this physical body, that's my truth. To the, the spiritual eye, which is to say, I am one with the infinite, I am in the hands of the divine at all times, Come what may, what difference does it make? 
And if you think of it like a, a spectrum from a pure understanding of our reality as spirit to a complete commitment to ourselves as materialistic, and then all the other chakras in between manifest the range of possibilities from that. Now, because the jiva is identified with these bodies, actually the jiva being identified with these bodies is the definition of the word ego. When, the, when our spark of the infinite identifies with the limited self, that's what ego is. That's why in spiritual life, ego is what has to be overcome. Now, that's not ambition, the force of personality, creative will, you know, personal power. That's not ego. Ego is the confusion that I am not infinite, I am limited. And when you understand that you are infinite and not limited, you overcome the ego. And you can still act in this world as great masters do, because they still can express enormous power, they just understand where that power comes from. It makes them far more the masters of this plane than those of us who are limited. So every time we respond to any experience in our life, we are, uh, we are committing ourselves to a certain vibration of reality. Someone I love dies, now I feel terribly bereft, so I'm not conscious of I am one with the Spirit. I'm not able to transcend my body and feel their presence everywhere. I've committed to some degree, you know, to the fact of matter, and that registers somewhere. Whenever somebody does something unkind to us and we decide we're not really going to love them anymore, that's committing to a certain level of self-will or selfishness. When somebody asks of us some great sacrifice and we're willing to give mightily of ourselves, then we add a certain vibration here. And what happens is the chakras, they're not physical, they are, they are what they call their vrittis, their whirlpools of energy. And so this whole system can hold thousands of incarnations worth of energy because it's just energy, it doesn't take physical space. And every time we do anything, we face any situation in our life, we commit energy at a certain vibration, and that energy is literally stored in the chakras. Okay? And so over the course of a lifetime, what happens is we begin to develop an energy pattern. And that energy pattern is always vibrating. And no matter how you present yourself, what you think about yourself, what your friends think about you, who you are is that energy pattern. It's metaphysics. You see, it's not an opinion. It's just what it is. And therefore, if you act consistently with kindness, that's really good. Because you begin to build up a vibration of kindness. And this comes phrases like, like attracts like what goes around comes around, things like that, because you are creating a certain vibration of energy, and these being vrittis, they create magnetism, and they draw to you whatever it is that, that matches you. Now, of course, over the course of many incarnations, we learn lessons, and we do things that maybe we later think were not such a good idea. But nonetheless, the vibrations are still in us. Now, because this is a, a vibrations of energy, they affect each other. And the more powerful vibrations can take on, uh, transform the less powerful vibrations. So we can change ourselves completely at any point by the amount of energy we put in a new direction. The only difference between a bad person and a good person is the way they behave. <laughs> and the way they behave is a reflection of the pattern that they've built in the chakras because those whirlpools of energy keep drawing us back into them. That's our karma. And that's how our karma is carried from one life to the next. Let's say in this lifetime you've been very loving and very self-sacrificing, but maybe in previous lifetimes the reason you're so loving and self-sacrificing now is because you were a big stinker in the last lifetime. And so there was a lot of energy built up on the stinker level. Okay? The fire chakra is self-will. Maybe you used all your self-will just to get what you wanted and you didn't care what happened. But toward the end of your life, you began to notice that that system didn't work so well. And you begin to learn the lesson 
that that kind of selfishness does not really bring me the happiness I want and is the source of my suffering. And so at the end of your life, let's say you figure out this was really a bad idea. But you're still born with this inclination to use your will this way. But now there's a piece of you that's always going to be resisting that. And so you start trying to, to live more from the heart chakra, which is a more loving chakra. And you still have all this will, but now you direct that will upward. And instead of just using it to get what you want, you try to hold it in and discipline yourself to use it for the best interests of all. And so you start drawing the energy that was stored there in the wrong understanding into a higher understanding. Okay, but now maybe what happens here is you're very, very nice to people, but there's still this part of you that you're nice to people because you want them to be nice to you. Okay? And that's better than just being selfish and mean. We have progressed. But that's not really living according to our unity with spirit. You know, Jesus didn't love just so that everybody would be nice to him. Buddha didn't, didn't love so that everybody would be nice to him. He loved because he was an instrument of the divine love. And he understood that it was in the fitness of things to love. And how people treated him in return was not the issue. It was simply that he was now acting according to what he knew to be right. So we progress, but not quite all the way. And so then we have to, we, we, we have to come back and have the opportunity again to act it out one more time and see how we're going to respond. This is, this is the process of reincarnation. And our chakras are this perfect blueprint of every unlearned lesson that we have, and we get drawn right into the vibratory reality that exactly matches the lessons that we're going to have to learn. I have had a woman friend, I'm not a, a particularly big woman myself, but she was uh, even skinnier. She was just kind of a skinny, really small, very, um, she did not look like she had any physical power. Every vehicle she bought, she bought, she bought these great big trucks, you know, <laughs> and she could like barely see over the wheel and she would, I mean, you could, you, you could hardly see that she could manage. And once I just said to her, this is a ridiculous vehicle for you. And she sort of said, I know, but my concept of myself is that I'm really big. <laughs> and she actually, whether it was apocryphal or true, she had this story that she really felt that she had really been a big, strong man for many incarnations but had gotten confused and began to think that being a big, strong man with big physical power was the right way to be and became very dependent on it and you know, just all sorts of things. It became an unlearned lesson. So she made herself this little skinny female body, but she still remembered, <laughs> you know, and she needed a big truck in order to express what she thought she was, balancing it all out. That's what we're always doing. Now, we're not balancing it out randomly. We're balancing it out so that the jiva will overcome the ego and stop identifying and drawing its happiness from limited conditions. Because what we're, where we're going and trying to get to is this perfect harmony with divine spirit. That's what the spiritual eye represents. And from here, everything comes into balance. Any other of the chakras that we try to live from are always incomplete. But when we live from here, the spiritual eye, what we've done is we've moved from ego identity, um, the jiva identified with limitation, to the jiva identified with infinity. And then every decision you make is always the right decision. You know, whether it's time to be stern, whether it's time to be compassionate, whether it's time to give in, whether it's time to stand strong, you know whether it's time to act in a physical way or to restrain yourself. Because if it's all guided from the jiva being identified with the infinite, then we begin to resolve the unlearned lessons instead of just endlessly creating more. You understand? Let me stop and ask if you have questions. Does anyone have any questions that I can... This is a very quick version of a very long subject. Yes? Um, how, okay, when, when, when the um, physical body dies, the, the spirit, the jiva, it still has a body. 
And, you know, this is why in the movies and everything like that, the, the physic now the movies are just so terrific because they really show us. The physical body falls over and then the same actor gets up, except now he can walk through the walls and things like that and he can float. That's actually not inaccurate. That's actually very, very close to what it is because the chakras still remain and therefore your essential consciousness is not changed because this collective vibration of where you are and how you're divided on the spectrum between spiritual freedom and ignorance, it, it's, it just remains. You just move out of the physical world into the astral world. Now, the physical world, the, the earth plane and all the other physical planets are heterogeneous, which is people of many different vibrations share the planet. And you can be sitting in a park and be a very refined person and a very unrefined person can sit right next to you. The astral worlds are homogeneous, which is you can only go into the vibration that's your vibration. So if you're a very evil person, you go to very evil places, you know, where everybody has that. That's where the concept of hell comes from. And because it really exists. And if you're a refined person, you go into refined vibration. And how long you stay there depends on the karma in your chakras. It depends on how, how urgent y the desires you still have are that, that require a physical body to fulfill. For example, if you're an alcoholic, or if you're a serious smoker, or if you're addicted to sexuality, and those things don't exist in the astral world, you get bored really fast, <laughs> seriously, and nothing much is happening for you, and you're, you're compelled it's just sort of like if you have a terrible desire for pizza, it's very hard to stay home. You have to go get it, right? And so you just take another body really soon. And some people are so unsubtle in their thinking that they, they as Yogananda put it, they never wake up in the astral world because they can't see a world that isn't <coughs> physical. They go, they go through what he called a gray dream. And they don't really wake up again until they have another physical body. They rest a little. You get to rest. Also... You know, sometimes people get really stale by the time they're old. <laughs> they're just stuck. They just, they're not making any progress, they're not learning anything, and they just have to have a fresh start. So you can hang out in the astral world for a very brief time, you can hang out for hundreds of years. It just depends on who you are, because you're, you can still make progress in the astral world. So if you're subtle enough to continue to make progress in the astral world, you stay longer. If it's useless to you, you come back to the physical world sooner. So it's very hard to say. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. In, in our religion, mm -hmm. when somebody dies, mm -hmm. it is said that the jiva remains there for about 12 days. Right. Just flitting around, getting used to the fact. Around. Yeah. yeah. So that's why various kind of religious exactly. things are being done. That's exactly right. Now think about it. You've lived in this body for a really long time. You've identified with it for a long time. It's not so simple unless you have trained yourself. If you've meditated and understand that your consciousness is independent of your brain, then you can transition into death much more easily because your brain begins to die, as Yogananda put it somewhat humorously. If you think you're only physical and your brain begins to die, you feel obligated to go unconscious, is how he put it. <laughs> If you know that your consciousness exists independent of the brain, you can literally watch your brain die. And you know, and it won't affect you. But the degree to which you're attached to your body, the degree to which the people around you are attached to your body, will affect how quickly you can transition away from it. And so excessive grief, for example, is not a sign of true love because excessive grief binds the soul to that physical body after that soul is trying to leave it. When we were, I was in Italy and we were going down the roads with Swami Kriyananda and there was a little roadside shrine and it was filled with flowers and so on and the man who lived there said, you know, this woman's son died in a motorcycle accident here, which of course is hard to bear, three years previously. And every day she came and put fresh flowers at the spot. Kriyananda said, what bondage for that soul. He thought of the son who's trying to go on and his mother is just desperately holding him there. 
Jesus, he said, that's not love. That's just using self-will for pure attachment. That's not understanding that, that your son died because it was the divine plan that he died. I'm not saying it was easy. It was a hard lesson. But that's the point of it. And so that, yes, many of the death rituals around religion are based on a perception of what's really happening in these situations. That's why the body is often left for a little while. Give the, give the person a chance. You know, give them, give them a chance to get used to it. And you'll feel, you'll often feel, right after someone died, that they haven't left. As my woman friend said to me when her father died, often people will choose to leave their bodies when there's no one in the room, too. Because finally nobody's holding them and they can get out. Because otherwise everybody's just clinging like this and they can't go. So she leaves her father for 15 minutes and of course that's when he dies. She came back in and she said she was immediately conscious of two things. One, that her father was there. He was in the room as present as he'd ever been. But he wasn't in his body. And she said the other thing was having only known him in that body, she had made the understandable mistake of thinking he was that body. And as soon as he stepped out of it, she recognized that the body he had inhabited and him were two entirely different things. Right? And the more clearly we know that, the more easily we can move. And ghosts, and ghosts are real, are people who just can't figure it out. And people, some, some people who had that kind of vision said after the 9-11 disaster when, you know, people are on the telephone making a big deal and then they're in the astral world, just boom, like that that they were wandering all over New York. In fact, many psychic people were talking about helping all these poor, confused souls realize that they were dead because they had no opportunity to get ready for it. So it's, you've got to be ready all the time. <laughs> you have to stay what I call karmically current because you never know. <laughs> yes, that's certainly, absolutely, not a problem. Any other questions? Yes. In extra will, is time linear or is it meaningless? Time is different, but as I understand it, this is a good question. My, my, a friend of mine who's an attorney who um, wanted it pinned down, he asked whether you always, you always incarnate progressively in time. Could you be in the 20th century now in the Civil War? Um, the way Kriyananda, I didn't know the answer to that, so I asked Kriyananda. He said, um, in this world, Time is a fixed entity and it moves in a linear way. So you, when you're in this world, you are bound by the linear progression of time, which is if you have an incarnation, now your next one will be in the time sequence in front of it. In the astral world, time passes. I, I, now this, I, have to, I have to think about this accurately. I believe that the astral world is also bound by time. Because I always hear it expressed that way. 700 years, Kriyananda once remarked that he spent 700 years in the astral world between physical incarnations once. So that talks about the same linear progression that would essentially match this progression. But I think it feels a little different. I think I know what you would say. Here, it's hard, uh, our, our perception is limited because we're only perceiving with the physical senses. And the physical senses are smaller than the astral senses. But the astral senses are not free. We still only can perceive according to the vibration that we're on. So I guess, I mean, I'm partly guessing here, but I'm putting it together, that it is linear, there is a sense of time, but it feels a little different. This is why Swamiji says to think in terms, Swamiji is what I call Kriyananda, to think in terms of eternity, sitting at the feet of God singing hymns, or just, you know, sitting in a, a golden cloud, he says, that's kind of his definition of hell. <laughs> it's just like, how long could you do that before it gets just a little boring? It's like there's a, a freedom that's far greater than just being comfortable according to what the ego thinks of, of as comfort. So, because see, after a while in such an atmosphere, you get bored and your, your physical restlessness comes in. We experience that in our own lives. You can, you can stay home, you know, and have two nice days at home, but then you begin to get a little restless, don't you? You get cabin fever. You have to go out and do something else. So you can hang out in the beautiful astral world for a while, and then you have other desires that have to be fulfilled, and you have to go and do them. Huh. Any other questions or thoughts or comments? I was not actually given an end time here, but I think we might be um, getting close to what we want to do. Okay, there's, um, 
Before we end our, our program here, though, I wanted uh, Tandava and Dambara, they have another song to sing for you. And this particular song is, I haven't talked about many aspects of the chakras, including that every chakra has a particular sound that goes with it. Yes, you have a question. Uh -huh. Right. So I've actually never gravitated towards that idea because I've never felt that anyone else can actually balance my chakras or spin my chakras. I just felt that that was part of my energy that belonged to me and no one else could manipulate them. Well, both, both points are true. Okay, I don't want to offend anyone. Many people who claim to be able to do that um, may have may may be more limited in their actual influence than they they think they are but understand now this is energy this is purely an energy field and a person of strong energy can influence another person's it, you know one per, a person a strong energy field can influence another energy field so if a person for example I'll use a very clear example I spent many years with Swami Kriyananda he had a very powerful f field of energy a very uh, completely uh, beneficial field of energy. He was very powerfully focused it, at the spiritual eye, and, he, and everything about him emanated this upward moving clarity. And one of the enormous benefits of being in relationship to a teacher is not just that they're bright and can give you good ideas, it's when you're actually with them, their energy field influences your energy field. Now, it will influence you to the extent that you open yourself to that influence. And a true teacher will not impose, but will only respond to your openness. A an evil teacher will impose. And that's a, hu that's a huge difference. That's exactly right. Now, people who are healers, who are genuine healers, who might not be as advanced as Swami Kriyananda was, but nonetheless have a, a, a sincerely intended, developed desire to help and have, have learned to move energy, can actually shift the energy in your chakras, whether or not it will last and how much they're able to do it will depend on the power of the healer and your receptivity. But to say that no one can do it for me is the same as saying, I have no friends and no friend can ever help me. For a healer to help you shift your energy in a positive direction is no different than Dambara saying to me, that by having let me carry it for you. Yeah. And my having the intelligence to say, yeah, would you help me? But you need to be conscious first of whether the person can really do it, and two, whether their energy is compatible with yours, and three, whether you're able to. See, a lot of times a healer can heal you, there was a very powerful healer. She later became known as Peace Paper. I don't think she ever came to this part of the world. She just literally walked out of her house one day and for the next 25 years just walked around the world. And she was a very powerful healer and she could reverse people's physical symptoms. You know, she, she could cure diseases like uh, MS. And she did. But then she began to notice that after a short period of time, people took their symptoms back. Mm -hmm. And so she began to ask a different question, which is, what is it that God wants me to do? And she realized the capacity to heal was not the same as the right to do yeah. it. But you see, that's the kind of healer you want. Yeah. You want someone who's going to act in a, a divine way, and then, by all means, personally, I need all the help I can get. Yeah. But yeah, I'm, I very, the I'm very careful about who I invite into my energy field. But not because I don't believe it's possible or I don't need help. It's just that it's a very sensitive reality. Mm -hmm. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, th these are the ones that I invite in because I have learned to trust them completely. Okay? That's a very good question. Any others before we shift over to the last song? This song is, is a journey up the chakras. <laughs> and it, it's in terms of the different sounds that are associated with each, each chakra. The first chakra is the sound of a, a bumblebee. The second chakra is the sound of a flute. The third, have I got it wrong? The third chakra, no, you're good so far. The third chakra is the bell, no, uh, the harp. 
correct? Yes. yes. That's why that's why we think of angels playing harps. The mm -hmm. third chakra is the harp. Fourth chakra is the bell. Fifth chakra. Uh, you are talking air in the trees. Pardon me, wind, wind in the, in the trees. trees yeah. Wind in the trees. And then this is the sound of the Om vibration, the great Amen. I'm only saying that because that's what the words of the song go through. So the song is about traveling up the chakras and come to the Om. It's a pretty nifty song. And I'm going to ask you to sit there all the time. Okay, no problem. So this is the Om song by Amanda. Vibrations burst and need your 